Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another edition of the Seed Platform Meeting um, being hosted by the Seed for Change Impact Cluster. Um, my name is Kabiru Ademo. I'm the local coordinator here in Kano for the Seeds for Change project. Um, Seeds for Change is a horticultural development project um, based in northern Nigeria, working from Kano. Um, it's been funded by the Dutch government with support from six of the top leading horticultural companies in the Netherlands. Uh, five of those are seed companies. One is a biological crop protection company. We try to develop the sector by doing a lot of capacity building work. We do trials and demonstration of new hybrid varieties that will increase the productivity of the Nigerian farmers uh, in the vegetable sector. We also work with a lot of the extension agents to be able to build their knowledge capacity and their ability to produce and train better farmers. Uh, the seed platform meeting is a quarterly event where we come in as stakeholders in the sector to discuss different factors and different uh, issues that are affecting the horticultural sector and see how we can reach out to the policymakers and improve the horticultural sector. We've been operational now for a year. We are in our second year. We have demonstration plots across Kano. We have trial fields in Kano as well, where we are testing new varieties that we feel will fit to the environment in Nigeria and help the vegetable farmers to improve their capacity. We've been able to do uh, some of our baseline studies, which will be out soon. We'll be able to publish that on our website and some of the training activities that we are doing in collaboration with Wageningen University uh, can be seen on our website, which we will be providing uh, as part of the slides. Um, so today we are focused on speaking about the importance of horticultural grade fertilizers to vegetable production. Um, we are happy to have uh, quite a few attendants coming in, and uh, we have some of our panelists here today who will be going around to introduce themselves. We have three very interesting panelists, a commercial grower, a distributor, and uh, someone from the association as well, from FEBSAN, uh, who are the Fertilizer Producers and Sellers Association of Nigeria. And I think um, this, between four of us, we represent uh, the different stakeholders, the different angles um, of the horticultural sector and also the fertilizer value chain. Um, so I will use this opportunity now to leave the panelists to introduce themselves, who they are, what the organizations are. So um, I think one of you can start, um, Ibrahim or Gabriel or Bengum, who wants to start, who wants to go first? Okay, so Ibrahim, yeah. yeah good morning, everyone. I'm Ibrahim Sheikh an agronomist at uh, LATC Agro. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hello. All right, good morning, all. I'm Bengom, hello. Uh, I'm the technical Uh, of fertilizer producers and suppliers associated with Nigeria. That's FEPSA. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar uh, The Importance of Horticultural Grade Fertilizers to Vegetable Production. Yeah, I'm Gabriel Okiki, the sales manager of Afri Agri Products Limited. Uh, Afri Agri Products, as a company, supplies high quality inputs to the Nigerian horticultural industry. And our input ranges from seedling trees, cocoa beets, mulching foil, seeds from Enza Garden, we also represent them, and we do irrigation system and horticultural grid water soluble fertilizers. Africa is also part of the local partners for Seeds for Change program. I'm really delighted to be one of the panelists today. Okay, um, thank you very much for that very quick and brief introduction. Um, so as we are all aware, 
uh, the productivity and profitability of the sector really hinges on how well the nutrition has uh, been provided to the crops and um, uh, ways of amending that is through fertilizer provision on either inorganic or organic or whatever fertilizer regimen has been chosen. Um, so between three of the panelists I have here today, I believe they can shed on light on different aspects of the importance of uh, the fertilizer to the growing of vegetables, the challenges, um, the state of the market as it may be. Um, so I would like Ibrahim Sheikh to start um, being a grower. I think it's only fair uh, we start with Ibrahim to give us a perspective as a grower um, about what it is growing vegetables, what his challenges is facing, and just general perspective and importance of fertilizers to his own production plan. Uh, he's having a bit of problem with Ibrahim. So I think we will move on to Gabriel. So Gabriel, um, I think we'll, the floor is yours. You can speak while we await Ibrahim. Yeah, I'll be talking on the role of fertilizers in planning horticultural production today. Okay. And yeah, in Nigeria here, yeah, we've been facing challenges on population growth, the population is growing very, very rapidly. Not just in Nigeria, everywhere in the world, and lands are becoming scarce for people to cultivate. There's an estimate from the USS Bureau that um, in 20, 2050, with the way the population growth is going at the rate of 3.2%, Nigeria should be targeting about 400 million people. So with that, bearing that in mind, you see it's not just to boost production by increasing the acreage we cultivate. We also need to boost production and increasing yield also has to do with the fertilizer we apply on the crops. It's very, very paramount in every sector. So with the horticultural sector, we'll be focusing on the roles of these fertilizers. According to research from the Smart Fertilizer Institute, the fertilizer accounts for 30 to 70% of crop yield. So it's very, very necessary. Aside the seeds, which are the proper it's very, very necessary to take into account the kind of fertilizers we are using for these crops. So I would be sharing a slide with the viewers. We have the overview of horticultural grade fertilizers. Uh, horticultural grade fertilizers are chemicals or natural substances other than limey materials applied to horticultural crops to supply one or more plant nutrients essential for goods. You see, with these fertilizers, yeah, you, you might have scenarios whereby one nutrient is lacking, but it's very, very important. We understand that each nutrient plays a specific role in the growth and development of this crop. But when one nutrient is lacking, you see that it might cause serious problem in terms of yield. In other words, the fertilizers used specifically for horticultural production. Horticultural fertilizers are available both in granular forms and as water soluble. But for the purpose of this study, I will be focusing more on the water soluble. Due to the advent of drip irrigation system, everybody wants to pass their fertilizer through the drip irrigation system. It's more efficient and it saves more time. Agriculture is evolving every day. Even on horticulture is also evolving. So people want to make things very, very easy for them. Then with horticultural grid fertilizers, you see there are free and contain very low rates of sodium and chloride. That's just a general overview of horticultural grid fertilizers. These fertilizers are designed to provide the element necessary for plant growth. And like I said before, each nutrient plays a different but very important role in the growth and development of the crop. You can see some of the common horticultural grade fertilizers we have. Just some of them on the table here with the ratio of the N, the P, and the K on the table. We have the ammonium sulfate, calcium nitrates, and a lot of us on the list here. Then we have the importance of 
water soluble. Like I said, the focus will be on the water soluble multicultural drink fertilizers. The ability to use them through the drip irrigation. Yeah, you use this water soluble fertilizers under the drip irrigation system. It provides an alternative to fertigate the plant. While you are irrigating, you could also as well pass nutrients to the plants. Then the low salt index. Yeah, these fertilizers have low salt index, and this reduces the potential for burning of the plant tissues. And it also makes this horticultural based fertilizer very, very suitable for holy application. They are very, very soluble. And once you use the drip system with them, it's passed them directly to the root zones of those crops, and they are absorbed fast, fastly and rapidly by the plant. Then you have the uniform distribution of nutrients, unlike the granulars. You see, with the water soluble fertilizers, the, the nutrients, when you dissolve them, they are distributed uniformly. In the case of granulars, you have a, a, a situation where people are applying manually and some patches has a bit concentration of those fertilizers, while the other patches, there are no, enough it's not even, it's not even the balance, you see. Then there is no risk of burning the plants as long as level directions, directions for dilutions are, are adhered. Lastly, we say they are more economical than solid granular ones for large scale practices. With fertigation, you mix the fertilizer, add to the plant, then you irrigate. There's even distribution. The work is less and it's very, very efficient. Then we'll be talking about the nutrients and the role they play in crop production. Horticultural crops, the nutrients. Individually, we talk about these nutrients. And with the plants, we have the macro elements and the micro elements. With the macro elements, it's further subdivided into two the primary nutrients, that's the N, T, and K nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. What's the role of nitrogen in crops? We see nitrogen, some people, they apply fertilizers on their farm. They don't really have the idea, the knowledge of what they are applying. For instance, now you have a fertilizer like urea, it's 46% nitrogen. So what is the effect of these primary nutrients? What is their role in crops? You see, with nitrogen now, nitrogen growth, it promotes rapid vegetative growth and formation of stem and leaf mass. When you want to have good foliage during the vegetative stage of your crop, you push in more in. Then another role of nitrogen in the crop is that it synthesizes amino acids, which in turn form proteins. That's very, very important for the crop. Then it also assists in the formation and function of chlorophyll. Then we have the P, the, pho the phosphorus. The role of phosphorus in crops, you see, it stimulates and supports early root and flower formation. That's very, very important for the seedlings when they are growing. There is this root system that the plant needs to get to push it through the cycle. So with phosphorus, that is the role of phosphorus in the plants. And then it initiates blooming fruit and seed development. Build results in roots. The role of potassium in crops. Potassium is one of the nutrients, that's the K, the primary nutrient. It's known as the quality nutrient because with potassium, it increases and improves the, the quality of that particular product. For instance, let's give it to tomato. With potassium, it improves, it improves the taste of the tomato. Not just the taste, the color as well. So another rule of potassium is that it increases disease resistance and hardiness of the crop. When there's enough potassium in adequate amount for the crop, it is less susceptible to disease. Then we have the secondary nutrients, the secondary macronutrients. We have the calcium, the magnesium, and the sulfur. It's not really a, nu a nutrient that um, is readily available in Nigeria, but we still have to talk about them because they are very, very important for horticultural production. The role of calcium in, calcium in crops, it, it's, it's in the formation of new cells. 
with calcium in the vegetable, you are very sure that you, it, it promotes post-harvest shelf life of the fruits. Then it also neutralizes acids and improves the soil structure. It improves the fruit quality. Like I said, with calcium, the, you, you, have, you have good post-harvest shelf life of your fruits. Then it also enables in capture, capturing phosphorus in the soil. The role of magnesium in crops. Magnesium is a nutrient that is actively involved in photosynthesis. It's also a cofactor for many plant enzymes required in the growth processes. It stimulates early growth and enhances the movement of sugars in plants. Then the role of sulfur in crops. The S, sulfur is essential in the formation of protein. It also maintains the green color in plants. With sulfur now, you have some vegetables like um, the garlic and the onions. It improves the odor of garlic and onions when you use sulfur or sulfate containing fertilizers. It improves alkaline soil. It also improves water penetration in compacted soils. Then we have the trace elements. What are trace elements? Trace elements are those nutrients that they are required in very, very small, minute quantity, but the plants need them in very small quantity, but they are very, very important for growth and development processes. Like I said, when one of them is lacking, it might play an important role in the yield of the plants. We have the iron, the boron, the zinc, the manganese, the copper, and the mold. Bent, molybdenum. The role of iron in crops, formation of chlorophyll and other pigments, other pigments like carotenes in carrots and xanthophylls. It serves as a catalyst for biological processes, respiration, symbiotic nitrogen fixation, and photosynthesis. Then we have the boron, the bee. What is the role of boron in horticultural crops? It aids in pollen tube formation during flowering. Then it also helps in the migration of sugars and um, bud growth and strong food sets. Then the role of zinc in crops. So like I said, I was saying before the network connection went bad, the micronutrients are very, very important. I listed some of them. I talked about the iron, the boron, and the zinc. So with the manganese, Manganese boosts phot photosynthetic activity by chloroplast production in plants. It also induces early growth. Then you have the copper, CU. It aids in photosynthesis and respiration. Then it also helps in protein synthesis, in formation of protein for the crop. Then you have the role of mol molybdenum in crops. It stimulates floral development. And it's very, very essential in bacterial nitrogen fixation in, no, in nodules of legumes, like the green beans and other leguminous vegetables. It's very, very important for fixing atmospheric nitrogen. Why horticultural grain fertilizers? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. Horticultural grain fertilizers is very, very important because of their low chloride content. Unlike the normal granular, the source content is very low. And these vegetable crops are very, very sensitive to chloride. Vegetable crops are very, very sensitive to chloride. So it affects the yield of the plants, the performance and the yield, general yield of the plants. Then what are the considerations, fertilizer considerations when planning horticultural production? You should have a fertilizer plan and that and should be based on a soil analysis of that particular land in which you are growing your, your vegetables. And we always recommend, we always advise that you do a soil analysis every three years. Then you have the climate. Climate is very, very important. Temperature, humidity, and it's very, very important factor when planning horticultural production, the considerations for fertilizer. Then the crop type. The crop type is also important. We see some crops are heavy feeders, some crops are light feeders. The type of the crop, the nutrient demand for a tomato is different from the nutrient demand for a cucumber or for a pepper or for a watermelon 
per se. So the crop type also determines your fertilizers you are to select when planning for horticultural production. Then the growth and development stage of the, of the crop, just like as we human beings, for these vegetable crops, at each stage of the plant, there is a different nutrient requirement. So that also has to be taken into consideration when you are selecting fertilizer and doing your planning. Then water quality. Water quality is also very important. The pH of the water, the EC of the water is very, very important for your horticultural production. Then we have the four R's, finally. The four R's, you apply the right products, the right fertilizer, at the right rates, at the right time, and in the right place. That's very, very important. Then fertilizer availability and price. An issue we'll come back to. These fertilizers, are they available locally? If they are available, what are the prices? Thank you, Mr. Kabu. Um, thanks a lot, Gabriel. Um, that was a, a very informative and uh, interesting presentation. Um, there are quite a few things. Uh, so you mean to tell me the taste of my tomato depends on the potassium intake of it. Yes. Uh, okay. It's a very interesting perspective. It's interesting to see the different needs and the different kind of fertilizers that you will need for um, for growing your vegetables. I would have assumed we just needed a few uh, fertilizers. Um, I have a few questions I would like to ask. Um, but before that, we will like to move on to our next uh, presenter, Mr. Bengum from Febsan. Um, so, um, Mr. Bengum, please, you can take the floor. You're on mute. All right. Thank you very much. And nice to be here. I'm sorry I was not able to prepare any PowerPoint. Uh, but maybe next time, because of my schedule, I have to rush in. So I apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to talk to about briefly about, uh, since uh, there's no need of going into fertilizer, uh, my uh, brother here have dealt with fertilizer very well, which I'm happy. So I'll just uh, talk about the industry. Uh, the fertilizer industry is a very big industry which has uh, let me say seven million metric tons, and then we have a consumption rate of uh, over ten million metric tons or so. With but we know that in Nigeria or in Africa at large. Uh, the consumption rate of fertilizer is very, very low, very, very low, very, very low. So, and then we know that uh, because of the nature of our soils in the country, uh, it's hard for you to get an optimum production of any crop per se without the use of fertilizer in this country. Uh, as uh, Gabriel have talked about the population growth, uh, we know that the, the population is massive now. We have over 200 million people, and they're cultivating the same piece of land. Uh, we can imagine the pressure on the land, and then the pressure on also the crop to produce. But then this can be eased with the use of fertilizer, which we know because without the use of fertilizer, uh, virtually most of our soils cannot produce within the country because the nutrients in the soil is very, very low, very, very low, because there's nutrient exportation almost every year. We keep growing crop. Some are heavy feeders of primary nutrient, as Gabriel have talked about. Some are heavy feeders of some of the secondary uh, nutrients we have. So if you look at it, year in, year out, we cultivate on the same pieces of land, and we take away the same nutrient in the same pieces of land, then definitely our production rate is going to be is going to drop, 
And then as an industry, we are here to help the farmer. We are here to help everybody to get the optimum production. If this uh, maize has a gene or a capacity to produce up to five uh, tons per hectare, then we are here to give you that optimal uh, that, uh, satisfaction that you need, or optimal satisfaction that the crop needs rather, in order to get to uh, uh, that particular uh, yield that it is stipulated to have. Uh, I also uh, want to talk about the, the different fertilizer blends that we have within the country. We have some fertilizer blends that are, are for now, for now, let me talk. Uh, most of the fertilizer blends that we have, they are generic blends. In the sense that a particular fertilizer, let's say maybe 2010, can be applied to tomato, uh, maize, rice, even soybean in some places, and the other, both the cereals and the uh, legumes, some of the legumes we have, which is not supposed to be so, because we know that even as we differ, so also the nutrient uptake of our plants differs. We know that some of these cereals are heavy uh, feeders, while legumes are not. And then you don't expect that the nutrient that a maize requires, rice also requires that. And you don't expect that the nutrient a maize requires, soybean or even groundnuts requires that. So we need to understand the soil, and then we need to understand the crop also. By doing that, it will give us, uh, let me say, a knowledge of what we are going into. And then as an industry, you can also approach us and tell us that, no, 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 I don't want 2010, I don't want 2015. This is the formulation I want based on the crop uh, uh, and the soil uh, information that I have. And then as an industry now, we are trying to see how we can go into crop and soil specific blend. Uh, we are, we are, we've, we've done some work or we are still doing some work. This is our second year of some trials I'm trying to see how we can bring some crop and uh, site-specific uh, blend in Kaduna and in Niger State. Uh, we, are, we are doing that. And then also we expect that, uh, I don't know, for horticultural uh, agronomy or horticultural farmers, and most of the time we don't, in Nigeria, let me use that. Uh, I, I, I hope I'm not assuming because I'm not into horticulture, I say. But uh, the general information I have is that most of the uh, horticultural farmers, they don't use fertilizer. A lot of the, uh, aside the big players, I'm talking of the small holder farmers that produce uh, vegetable and other, they don't use. But then for you to get an optimal uh, production from your vegetable crop, we know that you need fertilizer. Whether you like it or yes, you need fertilizer because, uh, uh, my brother here, Gabriel, talked about the role of some of the primary nutrients that we have, where he talked about some of the roles they play in the production of these vegetables. Uh, we know the role nitrogen play, we know the role uh, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, boron, we know all the roles they play in these vegetables. So for you to have a uh, for you to have an optimum production of your vegetable and then a nutrient-rich uh, 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 vegetable that will be selling to farmer, then you need to satisfy the requirements or the needs of that particular crop. As one of my, my lecturers said that we need to take care of this crop so that they will take care of us. If we take care of this crop, we are the one that will benefit from some of these nutrients that uh, this crop will be giving us. But if you produce uh, your crop without some of these nutrients, number one, you're not going to have uh, an optimal production from there. And then the nutrients, the nutrients in the crop uh, is not going to be there because we know that human being we drive at the nutrient that we have for proper functioning. Where if you look at nitrogen, even us, the human being, because it forms part of protein, even us, we need that. It's very essential to us. I mean, we need uh, the zinc that is uh, that the trace element that this crop will give us. And then as an industry and in the fertilizer sector now, we are trying to shy away 
from just production of fertilizer. We want to produce a, a nutrient-rich fertilizer so that we know that uh, we have a lot of nutrient uh, problem in some parts of the country. We see a lot of minor, minority children, but then we want to see how we can, as an industry, help to curtail some of these problems by producing a nutrient-rich fertilizer that can help to supplement some of the essential uh, nutrients through the feeding that some of these farmers are, are, are going to take or some of these children or our children are rather going to consume and even us that we're going to consume. So uh, there's a lot of things around fertilizer. Uh, there's a lot that's going around fertilizer and then the industry is fast growing. It's fast growing. And then I can encourage the vegetable farmer or the horticultural farmer to also key or buy into the idea. We have some um, maize farmers, the rice farmers, the other farmers that are key into this vision. The maize farmers have their own, their approaches, have their own blends that they want to be producing for their members. Every 27, 30, 13 plus sulfur, potassium, and other micronutrients. And then the rest, uh, the rice farmers also have their own. The cotton also have their own. But I'm yet to see that of the horticultural farmer. But I don't know, maybe Kabir will share more light on that. Maybe they are, they are trying to do something along that, uh, that line. I, I don't know about. It's a very big industry that we hope everybody can come into and then uh, invest into the industry. At the end of it all, our target is the farmer. And at the end of it, or I tell you, the humanity, what's the farmer, what humanity can get from all this. So uh, it is not enough to just produce food, but rather uh, a quality food or a nutrient rich food that when somebody takes, you know that yes, he has been taken care of, his body will know that yes, he, uh, this person has sprayed on something or he has taken something. Thank you. Sorry, the presentation is a bit short and brief. Thank you very much, um, Bengom. Um, that's very interesting perspective as well. Thanks a lot. Um, it's good to know that there's a lot of work being done uh, by different classes of farmers in terms of their own nutritional needs. Um, I know I've seen some of the rice blends before us at a few years back. Um, for horticultural growers, um, I will say because of the short, shorter lifespan of vegetables generally, and um, it's a lot more delicate. You need, I think, a lot more of the nutrition at different times of the growth. It might be easy, it might be harder to have one particular blend that will suit every crop at every stage. Um, but um, I will let someone that is actually in the field, I think, um, Mr. Ibrahim is online now, if I'm correct. Let me just have a look. Um, if Ibrahim is around so that he can give us some perspective as a commercial grower. So, um, Mr. Ibrahim. Hello, Ibrahim, can you hear us? Hello, Mr. Ibrahim. Okay, so I think Ibrahim is still having a lot of challenges um, with his internet. Um, so um, to the panelists, um, they have a few questions. We are meant to have a section where we are meant to have an open discourse within ourselves questions I might have for you as a, an importer and as a distributor talking to about Gabriel and as Fepson to Bengom. And I had some questions I really wanted to ask Ibrahim. And I believe a lot of our participants are in the same uh, situation as I am. They too have questions. So for all of the participants that are hearing me, um, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat. I really wanted them to go into the Q&A. If we can put our questions into the Q&A, section so that it's easier to know what questions have been answered. 
Um, but um, we are going to start going through some of the questions now so that we can see uh, how. So um, I have a question here from uh, P Squad um, from Femofeed BV. And the question, I think this will be more relevant to you, Gabriel. Um, Hello? Hello? So, um, Gabriel, you said the question goes, there is a lot of um, focus on chemical-based products. And um, there are known challenges like causes of soil degradation. Why is there still a huge emphasis on chemical fertilizers and not looking at alternative sustainable products? Um, so as a distributor and someone that's quite knowledgeable in the field, um, I would like you to speak on that a bit for us, please. OK, thank you, Mr. Kabir. Responding to the question from P. Squats from Fermo Beach, uh, it has a lot to do with um, the country we find ourselves in. Using chemical fertilizers, like I said, I spoke specifically about um, the water soluble horticultural grade fertilizers. They are tailored specifically to the crop needs. You don't have a lot of um, deposit and teaching on the soil. These horticultural grade water soluble fertilizers, you use them to produce vegetables with acceptable residual limits of chemicals. When Nigeria, a country where we find ourselves, it's not as if we don't um, advocate for organic per se, but you see, it has to do organic. It has to do with the mindset. There are products that are sustainable, but maybe ease of use is also the problem. The problem with the organics is that it's not as if I'm against people selling organic, but you can't really tell me this is an organic product and. You see, with many of the certificates of analysis I get from them, they are not really giving me the ratio of N, the ratio of P, the ratio of K. It gives flower, it gives um, the fruits, it makes everything, but they have to be a certain ratio of these nutrients. With soil degradation, the water soluble fertilizers, like I said, there is room for alternative sustainable products. There's always room for that. We are, Nigeria we are always are open to improvements, both now and in the future. But for now, the main emphasis should be on water soluble fertilizers, horticultural grade water soluble fertilizers. Thank you, Mr. Kabir. Okay, so Gabriel, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is that um, the issues you have with that is that it's not readily available in the market and those that are available have quality issues because they are not giving you the exact uh, yes. the exact breakdown like the exact analysis of yes. what the micro exact element breakdown is not good. yes okay um just out of curiosity mr bengon do you have anything to say about using organics or other sustainable methods of fertilization um, I have a little to say about that. And um, if we look at the population pressure or the population growth in Nigeria, if we are to be realistic to ourselves, it is very difficult to feed the whole nation with organic product or organic fertilizer. It's very difficult because for you to have, let me say, the required nitrogen for your soil, you have thousands or you have uh, plenty tons of uh, these uh, organic products. And then how many of these organic products do we have that are easily available within the country? That's one question. And then two, what are the source of your, uh, your organic product that you're going to uh, use as fertilizer? If you look at it, uh, it's not that the organic fertilizers or the organic products are not really available. They are, but can they sustain the population that we have? Can they feed the over 200 million that we have? If we are going to, I'm not sure 
uh, we are going to be sustainable in terms of food, or I, I'm not sure if we're going to be food secured in this country. So for now, and where we are, we just have to go with the chemical fertilizer. For now, they are the best shot. We are trying to see how we can fit the nation first. Let people have food and eat, then the nutrient aspect of it will come. And I hope we we'll get Sunday. We are on the process and we're on the right, the right track. We'll sure get it will surely get there Sunday. But for now, it's not sustainable. Let me let me add Hello, Mr. Kabir. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, let me add up to what um, Mr. Ben said as well. With um, the organic to say, you see, the aim of farming is not just to do it for fun as a hobby. Farmers also need to make money from the business. Organic is not, it's also stressful. And you see, you do something organic, Mr. Kabir, taking for instance, I'm Mr. A, you are Mr. B. We both grow our crops and we take them to the market. You grow organic. And you get to the market, nobody's paying a premium for your produce. Nobody's ready to pay a premium price. So it's not just about, it's more than, there's a long way to go about that because farmer needs to make money on what they grow. Profitability also matters in this um, line of business. It's not just about productivity. So when you look at the profit, people are not willing to pay that premium that yes, this thing has been grown organic and it's a bit um, very safe for consumption. People are not willing to pay that. So based on that, you see, the market is gradually coming up, but I think it will still take time. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank Thanks a lot for your answers. Um, that's quite a, a perspective to look at it. Um, I mean, uh, the question that was asked was mainly aiming towards how to sustain the soil in terms of soil degradation. So I think uh, personally, I feel the balance between the two will help our growers having organic approaches or uh, sustainable alternatives as well as the chemical approach, depending on what crops you are growing. Um, from my experience, I think uh, most of our farmers anyway, the smallholder farmers are always using a combination of the two. There's a lot of soil amendments, using a lot of organic manure, organic compost, uh, and sometimes they still use the chemical fertilizers when they can afford it. Um, but I think striking a balance is key. But that being said, I think Mr. Ibrahim is back online. So uh, Mr. Ibrahim, if you can give an input about the issue of um, sustainability, soil degradation, using organic fertilizers versus um, using uh, chemical horticultural grade fertilizers. And also, if you can use the opportunity while your internet is on now to speak on your own experience as a grower with availability of fertilizers, the state of your production based on fertilizer. Um, Ibrahim? Hello. I, yeah, hello. I, hear you. I hello. want to share my screen, but it's not possible. Can you hear me look into that? Okay. Yes. Um, we'll, I'll speak with the. Okay, let's see what okay. we can do into that. But you can carry on talking. We'll try and sort that out. You Can you my... share the screen now? Yeah. Try. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. I can see some very beautiful fruits. <laughs> and vegetables. Uh, hi, yes. everyone. My name, my name is Ibrahim Sheik from uh, LATC Agro. I'm an agronomist. LATC Agro is a commercial farm. We, we, do, we, we grow vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, and uh, other vegetables. I will speak about the importance of horticultural grade fertilizer for vegetable production. I think, uh, okay, based on the, uh, 
the country now, it is very, very difficult to meet up the demand of the population based on the available resources in the country, like arable land, because I think that development is really going on in the country now, or people are going into real estate. So a lot of people are not going to agriculture, which is making it difficult for farmers to get enough land in, in, in planting. Sorry. And things like uh, poor funding for local farmers and uh, inadequate technical know-how. We all know about the problem of uh, our uh, of, 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 of the country now, because farmers now, they don't have enough uh, information. Even the, 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 the government officials are supposed to to give the farmers more information about what they need, they are not really there. And we know that we have now, presently now, there are a lot of pests. Our soil are not fertile anymore, which is really hampering our uh, agricultural production in Nigeria. So with these in mind, we all know that now it's important to use fertilizer. It's very difficult to grow now without fertilizer in the country. And uh, what are the importance of fertilizers? You can see the, the fertilizers will make the, they will increase the, they will make the plants, it increases the, 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 the plant immunity, but it, an healthy plant will be able to fight pests and diseases. And a lot of fertilizers, we, the fertilizer will help in holding water capacity for plants and increase the root depth. We have potassium that give the plants strength to be able to absorb water from the ground. We have the phosphorus that help in, in, in faster root development. We have nitrogen that help in, in, in vegetative state. As well, we have the, some nutritional benefit of vegetables. Now we have a lot because it's because of the level of uh, the poverty in the country. Sorry to say. A lot of people does not have the access to get some of these nutrients. So it's see the vegetables that we eat, that we consume, that give us some of these nutrients like vitamin A, like folic acid and vitamin C. And quite a lot. I'll go on the, the, the different type of fertilizers. I, from what somebody asks, he asks about using organic fertilizer. Yes, I think what we do here is blending the two together because in production, you need to use organic fertilizer like manure compost and your inorganic fertilizer as well, so that uh, they help one another, so that you have a very good uh, production. We all know the importance of manure, they bind the soil together for you, so that when you apply your inorganic fertilizer, the plant will be able to hold the nutrients very well for plant or uptake. And uh, I will go into what is horticultural grade fertilizers. We talk about uh, different type of fertilizers, but now we talk about the inorganic, we have the feed grade fertilizers and the horticultural grade fertilizers. I think majority of fertilizers that we have in the country is that the feed grade fertilizers, like the 2010-10, the 15-15-15, and, uh, and the rest. But horticultural grade fertilizers are something like, uh, they are like calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate, MAP, which I, I don't think we are producing that in the country. And I had the, the, uh, the uh, Mr. Bengon saying that uh, horticultural farmers can come to them to give us some blend. I, I still can't believe that uh, we have doing this kind of fertilizers in the country. And what are horticultural grade fertilizers? They are soluble fertilizers that supply one or more nutrients that are readily available for plant uptake. These are fertilizers that are readily available for the plants. They are readily available for the plants. And uh, vegetable crops are, are kind of uh, different from other crops. These are, they are heavy feeders. They need fertilizers. They need something that is, that will be readily available for them. They are short-time crops. They are not crops, they are not uh, perennial or perennial crops. They are short-time crops that we have 30 days crop, we have 45 days, we have up to 60 days. So we need a fertilizer that will be able to provide the necessary a nutrient that the plant needs at that period in time. And why, why horticultural grade fertilizers for vegetables? First of all, vegetables are short-term crops, like I mentioned earlier. 
Horticultural grade fertilizers will give the necessary nutrient that the crop need for the, for the period of time of, 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 of their production. They are heavy feeders as well. Vegetables are heavy feeders. They need fertilizers. They need different grade of fertilizers. They need a lot of fertilizers, like the potassium nitrate, the, which is a, a 1346. When fruiting, but, uh, the vegetable crops, fruit vegetable crops, they need a lot of potassium, which uh, our feed grade fertilizers cannot even really give them what they need because some of these seeds that we are we are growing in horticulture in, 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 in horticulture industry are, are uh, they are hybrid seeds, and we know that hybrid seeds are, are high performance seeds. And before you be able to give you what you need, you need to give them what they, what they want as well, which is great agricultural grade fertilizers. And uh, we talked about fertigation as well. What is fertigation? Fertigation is the mixing of uh, fertilizer with water and supplying to the plant. That is supplying fertilizer with water at the same time to the plant. Feed grade fertilizers are not really soluble that you, 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 you mix with your, with your what we call precision farming, using of drip irrigation. By using drip irrigation, water, water wastage, fertilizer wastage, because it's going to give the plant, the plant it is it's supplying the nutrient directly to the root of the plant, which helps in, 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 in improving yield. And again, we look about foliar, foliar feeding. This is an aspect of uh, fertilization that uh, a lot of people are not going into, uh, which is really, really helping in, improve, in, 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 in increasing yield. Because like, let, let me give an example of uh, a nitrogen or a potassium deficiency on a plant. If you want to correct a deficiency, deficiency in plants, the fastest way to correct a deficiency is through foliar feeding. With horticultural grade fertilizer, uh, with uh, feed grade fertilizers, how are you going to do that? You still need to apply to side dress and wait for the fertilizer to dissolve. And, if, and then with foliar fertilizer, you are supplying it directly into the plant, which in a shorter period of time is going to correct the deficiency. And generally, all these will improve yield, which on the long run will make the farmer happy. Because what we all need is, is, is yield, and yield translates into money, return on investment, which, which will improve the economy as well, and the livelihood of farmers. Let me go to the next slide. Now, this is the problem that we are facing now, difficulty in sourcing fertilizers. Of recent, I think about a year ago, now it has been very, very difficult for us in the vegetable uh, industry to, 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 to access these uh, horticultural grade fertilizers because of non availability. I think it's a government policy because of uh, us producing fertilizer in the country. But what we really need is not what they are producing in the country. We need horticultural grade fertilizer, not feed grade. And this is really affecting our industry a lot. That's brought about reduction in quality, quantity, and yield in general, which cost of production too has increased drastically. And we all know the when cost of production increase and the return, the yield is not there. It's just like child's play. You will not get what you need, and you are just there doing all your all, all your best. And on the long run, you will not even get the yield that you need. So it's it's just unfortunate now for the industry and we all know the importance of all these horticulture like example we have potassium nitrate now that is a very difficult uh, fertilizers for us in the country now we have some some crops that are in fruiting state that need a, a lot of potassium How are you going to give it to them by supplying 201010 they have just 10 percent of, uh, of potassium and you need more of potassium than nitrogen, or are you going to give 50, 50, 15 at fruiting stage? So it's just been a problem to us. And talking about calcium nitrate as well, you have a lot of fruit and all of them are, they have blossom androids. Where are you going to sell it to? So this is impacting our industry a lot. It's making us to lose a lot and it's, it's been difficult. Even the ones that you are going to get are not great. 
And again, if you are even going to get, you are going to get it at, at a cost price, which is going to increase your cost of production. So it has been so, so, so difficult for us of recent. And what are the effects of vulnerability of fertilizers? It increased cost of production, reduction in yield, increase, increased poverty rates, unemployment rates. A lot of farms are laying off their staff now because of low yield. They cannot sustain the plant, the farm. This is making it so difficult for plant to for a farm to employ people on their farm. And this is leading to unemployment in the country, which we increase poverty rate in, in the country as well. It's been very, very difficult for people to get jobs. And now farming industry, they are making they are, they are finding it difficult to sustain their farm. So they are laying out a lot of a, 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 a lot of staff just because of fertilizer. And malnutrition, as we all know, the importance of uh, vegetables. So it's so, so difficult for us. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, it's quite uh, mm -hmm. it's it's quite unfortunate to hear about some of the challenges you have, but at the same time, um, seeing the passion and seeing the resilience that uh, you are showing in your mm -hmm. farm and uh, the general uh, culture of Nigeria has always been resilient. I think we've been able to keep moving. Um, there are a lot of questions that have been asked um in terms about the fertilizer availability and there's also some questions popping up about the soil improvement so um i think it's time now to do it like a panel so we can start addressing some more of the mm -hmm. questions to some of uh, our panelists so um i have a question here um this is for you bengom um, it's coming from Usman Barao, and um, he says, is there any effort from agrochemical companies, uh, agrochemical companies to solve the problems faced by farmers as regard banning of some fertilizers, e.g. 15-15-15, DAP, MOP, and uh, CAN, that is calcium nitrate. Uh, so, Mr. Bengom, um, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Uh, so, um, that's the question. Is there any effort from agrochemical companies to solve the problems faced by farmers as regards to banning of some of these fertilizers, MPK 1515, DAP, MOP, and CAN? And um, is it really banned? You know, so just share well, some perspective with us on that. Okay, uh, there was actually a ban of, of, of fertilizer, fertilizer uh, products within the country at around 2018 December, I think so. Sorry, I think I'm, I'm right with the date. Around December 2018, there was a ban on fertilizer importation, and then a forex on fertilizer importation was taken up by the CBN. Uh, but the good news is that the ban was just to encourage local production, but not to harm the farmers. But it was done strictly to encourage local production. And that has helped the industry to grow. I think uh, as we stand now, Nigeria has, the, has been leading uh, in Africa in terms of uh, fertilizer production. Uh, we have capacity to produce close to 7 million metric tons. I think it's a plus on our side. We have over 30, 33 blending plants. Yeah, we have over 33 blending plants that are registered. And we have orders that are not registered with FEPSA. And we have about three production plants of urea. That's uh, the Dangote fertilizer, the Indorama, and the Notori. The Dangote has just done his test run, I think months back, I spoke with the MD, done, it, done their test run. So hopefully before next season, they'll come into production and then they have capacity to produce about uh, 2 million metric ton. Uh, Indorama has about 1.5, the total for the year, I think we have almost about 4 million or 4.5 metric ton or so, which is a plus uh, because this cannot, this can satisfy both Nigeria, West Africa, and other parts of uh, the African country, which we are trying, I think WAFA and Association, West African Association, trying to see how they can do this. So the ban is not to, let me say, to, to harm the farmer but is to encourage local production locally. 
within the country has been displaying that. And then the ban on on 15, 15, 15. Uh, I think as an industry or as a nation, we need to shy away from the generic blend of 15, 15, 15. The truth is some of our soils don't need that. Let me see, let me, let me not tell uh, like, because we know a soil property might differ from one foot to another, one step, just one feet. By the time you move another feet, it's a have different uh, property. But then the soil in Nigeria doesn't need 15, 15, 15. That's just the truth. So that means if it doesn't need 15, 15, 15, then the farmers are paying what soils need. That's why I say as an industry, I don't know if you could still remember actually it's acidic nature. We know that it destroys our soils and, and the other thing. But then the MOP, the DAP, we still import them. But then they come into the Nigeria as raw materials. But then if you have your forest, you can also import it and then you can use it. But then just know that you have your own forest, it's going to cost you more than using the federal uh, uh, government forex because we know that the federal government has the dollar as setting point. And if you go to the black market, you'll find out that all things are so, you know, it's going to cost you a lot. But we still have the DAP, which we get from Morocco. We still have the MOP, which we get mostly from the uh, uh, Russia and other parts of the world. We still have them within the country. But then most at the time is used as raw material for blending. Because we know that our NPK, we blend them from urea, MOP, and DAP, and then some uh, what they call the fillers, which we normally use limestone or so. So we still have them available in the country, but most at the time as uh, blending material. But then the ban on NPK, we still have some blending plant that blend NPK. I still could remember we have coding that they blend that produce or chemically uh, blended 15 15. Uh, for now, there's no company that's producing that. So most of the chemically blend 15 15 you see uh, in the country is being imported. And then now there's ban and then there's uh, issue of forest. So not everybody would like to have his own forest to go and bring this product because it's going to cost you more. And then how much are you going to sell to the farmer? Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for that clarification, uh, Mr. Bengo. Um, the only question I will add, and I think um, someone has already asked that as well in the chat, um, which is a question that comes to mind, is are any of the companies registered in FEPSAN at the moment actually looking towards blending or manufacturing horticultural grade fertilizers in Nigeria? So things like potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate, and um, just any of the more water-soluble fertilizers. Uh, yes, I think, let me say, uh, over 50 or 60% of the uh, blend, uh, blenders we have in Nigeria are ready to produce that. But the challenge we have is the demand. You know, the demand will move the industry to produce that. But when there's not something, uh, at the end, you will not even get some money. Back. But if there's a demand, if there's a high demand, even today, if you need it, I can assure you that there are a lot of the blending plants are ready to do that. But then it has to move by the demand. If there's a demand, we have the capacity. And while, while what will stop us, what will stop us, we have the capacity, we have the machine. But, but then the demand, the demand. Because now for the horticultural crop, uh, you can't, uh, I don't know if they have an organized body that uh, needs a large quantity of fertilizer, and they can go and uh, approach a particular company and say, this is what we need. want you to produce that. I think it has to start also. And I know these farmers that if they don't know this product, if you send it to the market, they will not pay. That's why now a lot of farmers 
are still agitating for 1515 because previously they used 1515 and it worked for them. And even if 1515 will cost them 20,000 naira, believe me, you, some are ready to pick it at that price because they've used it and it works for them. So for you bringing new products is a whole lot of processes because these fertilizers, these farmers, they don't know. And Um, hello, Mr. Bengum. You're you keep so that's so yeah. I can hear you. Please speak on. Okay, okay. So I think your there was a lag um on your internet. So I can't I understand that. So as a producer, you want there to be demands anyway. Um, but generally there's also the school of thought that if something is not available, you will not demand for it. If I go to the shops and I see a product, then I will want to keep asking for it. But if I can't find it, I might not be aware that it's available. So um, it's an interesting one. Which one do we put first? Do we put the demand before the availability or do we make some available before the demand increases? Uh, but I think there's something that we really need to speak more about but you mentioned something to me that i feel is very important which is there needs to be like an umbrella body or coming together of horticultural practitioners to actually know what quantity do we need and we can bring them together and speak to fepson and say look we need such amount of tonnage a year and what can be done about this how can you provide that for us so um That's a question I can't answer right now because I've never actually thought of different farmers how much it is in the north or in the south or as the case may be. So um, that's an interesting aspect to be brought up. Um, a few other um, that's uh okay so i'll look through some of the other questions i think the next question is aimed towards i think i'll put this question out there any of you can answer it it comes from one of the other panelists and it says uh, is the mode of application um because you need drip irrigation sometimes to be able to apply these soluble fertilizers and some of our smallholder farmers who still make a big bulk of our production of horticulture are not using drip irrigation. They are mainly using flood irrigation and furrow irrigation. Uh, and also trying to apply it foliarly means they have to do it repetitively and that increases their labor cost. Could that be a reason why these horticultural grade fertilizers are not being adopted and what can be done about that? I don't know if, if between Gabriel and Ibrahim, if you have any ideas or have something to say on that. Uh, about the foliar application, let me start from that. You don't really need to apply fertilizer, uh, foliar, uh, fertilizer, uh, fertilizer foliar throughout the production of throughout your production you only you only need to apply fertilizer foliar true foliar means if at some critical stages of your production that is when you really need to apply your fertilizer true foliar and if you have the efficiency that you need to correct that is it's not that you are going to be applying fertilizer your fertilizer true foliar means throughout the production you only need some certain at critical stages of your of, of your production, that is when you need to apply fertilizer true foliar means. And uh, about the yes, small scale farmers cannot uh, use uh, drip irrigation; they use flood irrigation. Yes, you can still use your horticultural grade fertilizer. What you need to do is that you only need to apply it after you have supplied your water into the, into the field. Not that you apply your fertilizer, foliar, uh, your horticultural fertilizer, and then you now bring in water. No, you only need the, you only need to apply it when your your soil is moist. You can then do top dressing of it, just like you are top, because farmers do top, top dress their field grade fertilizers. So you only need 
the, the, the soil to be moist to apply the horticultural grade fertilizers. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lord Ibrahim. That's a, a very good answer. I think I've actually seen that being done recently uh, by someone that was trying to put in uh, Sologo NPK. Um, there's another question here, and I think I'll address this to you, Gabriel. What's the difference between N organic source fertilizer and N from inorganic or chemical source fertilizers? Uh, the, the difference is that nitrogen is actually nitrogen. But the difference is with organic fertilizers, they also play an important role in maintaining the soil structure. Not just as if they are supplying the nutrients. Like you have the poultry manure and the, for instance, the cow tongue, those are organic tanks. They have high concentrations of nitrogen. They don't just supply the nitrogen, the nutrients itself. They also en enriches the soil. They keep life back to the soil gradually. But with the case of inorganic, the plant is taking the end directly. That's just a uh, basic difference. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how to make some of our attendants be able to speak and ask their questions verbally. Uh, please bear with me while I try to figure out how to get that done. So some of Our attendants can actually read in uh, some of the questions out. Um, I have a question here from Dami Lola, and he says, emphasis are not placed on smallholder and local farmer on vegetable production. 80% of these local farmers may not afford soluble fertilizers, but well-blended granular fertilizers at good production cost for the farmers. In Tanzania, Morocco, Kenya, and to mention a few other places, they have well-blended fertilizers for each crop. Can you tackle production of blended fertilizers for a few important crops? I believe this is going towards you, Bengo. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. I think uh, in my introduction and then my presentation, I talked about as an industry went into crop and size specific uh, fertilizer, which uh, we are also discussing that. And then so far now, we are, uh, we are working on rice, uh, maize, soybean, and cassava, but uh, that of cassava uh, is still on hold. But the three crops we have started and is moving. This is the second year for trial for Kaduna and Niger State. And then hopefully at the end of the growing season, we're going to draw a conclusion and uh, see some graded fertilizer are specifically designed or produced for maize, for soybean, and for rice. So uh, we are growing, and this is just a starting point, and we hope to have a lot of this. Uh, that's why in my presentation, I still recall I asked uh, Kabiru about uh, the horticultural uh, system. Did they have anything? I talked about the different uh, stages, uh, required different uh, a fertilizer, but then I think it's something we can do. It's possible. It's possible. Uh, now we are trying to shy away from the generic plant. Then the next step now, after the, uh, shying away from the generic plant, is going into crop and size specific plant. And then uh, gradually, now it's gaining assemblers, even from the, with the farmer. So with time, we'll reach there. But for now, we only have that of maize, rice, and soybean which will be soon, uh, which will be out soon. And then the other cross uh, we follow later. Okay, um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Bengam. Um, we will definitely reach out with you and still speak about having some of these blends. Um, what we need to do, because we are developing crop guides at the moment um, as part of the Seeds for Change, um, we've been so limited with the fertilizers available that we're working with just new rate of potash and urea and um, trying to see how we can use 2010-10 to get some of our phosphorus. Um, but we all know that ideally I will not want farmers to keep using new rate of potash like uh, Gabriel has mentioned, it's got high chlorine content that might make the vegetable sensitive to it. So we will have to sit down 
uh, give you our demands, what we think will work for different crops and see what can be done in terms of granular fertilizers. Um, but at the same time, there's still that need to have the soluble fertilizers for the high production companies that might have greenhouses. It would be good to have greenhouses dripping their needs are and to see if they, are, if they might have to be able to uh, seek for their own crops uh, from the international market, for their own fertilizer, sorry, from the international market or import it themselves or a bit of a waiver granted to allow them to do that or companies that are important to be able to do that. Um, but I had a question, um, I think, about Damilola. And um, uh, Damilola, can you hear me? I think your mic has been unmuted for you to make, uh, to speak. So, uh, uh, Mr. Damilola, you can unmute your mic and um, speak. All right, can you hear me, Mr. Cabell? Yes, I can hear you. Are you happy with the answer and how I presented your questions? Um, it's fine, but for me, I think uh, uh, um, uh, the solution can take many years. And um, when our president and um, let me say the government have been banning majority of the production, being imported to the country and um, we don't have anything for exchange. Um, um, Mr. Ibrahim have, um, have tackled that uh, even 2010 is, is not even quality, even 15, 15, 15 that we are managing, it's not a quality type to, to, to do majority of vegetable production. And I think all this is for vegetable production. And I, I, I don't think we should be talking about um, rice or talking about meat maybe sweet corn, okay, in this kind of discussion. We are talking about um, vegetables, and I think attention should be, should be taken to vegetables. Majority of the fertilizer that we have in town, is not, they are not suitable. And we are talking about uh, yield, farmers are struggling, and, um, and, um, and a, lot of, a lot of discussion have been going on. So still working on cassava meals, and um, you are, uh, um, um, vegetables being lacking behind in production, and a lot of farmers, let me say more than 70, 80% of farmers, even still doing severe and all crops, these are, they are still coming back to do the eating because they know little production will give them more money and they lose more money when they don't seek input. So in how many years are we going to wait when the government are banning a lot of input that farmers are using? I think emphasis that should, should be made, should, should, should be put uh, uh, hands together where, where they should see eyes in, in vegetable production too. I, I, I see Uncle Bora program uh, happening in um, in um, uh, is it Kirby? no Kano, yeah Kano for Dangote project and a lot of flaws because of impute and 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 uh, this should be tackled. I, I look at Kenya history where at each, each stages they have granular where they have um, 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 a map with uh, a nitrogen. Where, where they have those formulation at different stages, three stages they will just apply three fertilizer and all the nutrients have been there. So the, if Nigeria is still lagging behind, and I don't know where we are going to come into, into this, in this solution of this surface when we are talking about, we are still struggling to do rice, we are still struggling to do maize that is, has been growing ancient in Nigeria. So, so when are we coming to this land like the, uh, Mr. Mr. Bengun? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Damilola. I mean, uh, not to answer for Bengum, but I think there was one thing which I will reemphasize that he mentioned. There needs to be uh, a kind of umbrella head. There needs to be a coming together of horticultural producers to state our demand clearly. And um, but I will allow Bengum to speak about uh, what Damilola has had to say. Okay, uh, Damilola, thank you for your question. But you should also understand that FEPSA is not government. Please just put that at the back of your mind. That FEPSA is not government. So the little effort and the little money that FEPSA puts in order to get this done should be appreciated. FEPSA is an umbrella body for all the fertilizer blending plants. The reason why I make mention of maize, rice, and even soybean is not because I don't understand that this uh, meeting is for the horticulture but it's just because I'm trying to tell you that something is going on in the industry and then a revolution has started 
from the generic blend to crop and size specific blend. Uh, if you look at the statistic now, can you tell me how many of the vegetable farmers are using fertilizer for their production? That means the local farmers, not the big time players. I'm talking of the local farmers. Uh, I, my parents are farmers before I became a farmer. So I was, I was born into a farming family, you know, in the North we produce. So unless maybe you are, you are fortunate to, to grow up in a city, but I grew up in a, in a village where we, we produce, we produce our vegetable, uh, tomato, uh, okra, pepe, amaranth and other things. We've never used fertilizer for that. We've never, we've never used fertilizer. So what I'm trying to, to say in essence is that uh, if there's a need, if there's a demand on ground, then the fertilizer industry is ready to produce this fertilizer for us. The reason why we've started with uh, rice, the maize, is because it's an, they have an organized body that they come together. They said, okay, we want you as FEMSA to produce this for us. Under Anko Borowa, they say, we want you to produce, let me say like 200 trucks of fertilizer. How many trucks of fertilizer did these uh, horticultural farmers need now? Can you tell you their, their, their nutrient needs? And then if this fertilizer is produced, how many of the horticultural farmers would like to come and pick this product? These are some of the questions. This, this is a private organization. And then, you know, they run business for, for profit. Nobody will produce something that nobody will pick. I can't go and produce a fertilizer that the fertilizer will be re, will remain in my store. Nigerian farmers are very are very intelligent. Let me use that word. They are very intelligent. If they don't know a particular product when it comes to the market, before it can accept that, it takes time. Hello. Okay. Um, if you can hear me, thanks a lot, Bengum, um, for your response. Um, which is a good point he mentioned. Uh, Fepsan is not the government, uh, but you would agree with me, Bengum, if you can hear me and the rest of people that you have a way of being able to last with government and um, you can actually lobby with the government. So I still, I think someone has also reemphasized that time. point. So that was I gradually it. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bengum. Um, we will have to find a way for the horticultural sector and for FEPSAN to work together to be able to get what we need. Um, I think it's very important. What is clear, the fact that we are on here is that we are all looking for the productivity to assure the food security of a country. Um, there are ways where you were growing maize before and we didn't need any fertilizers, but as the demand the expectation and also the capacity of your soil decreases, then we need to improve our production. Um, we foresee a Nigeria where we can have a horticultural production that will compete with some of the best markets in the world. You know, Morocco is doing a lot in terms of fertilizer. They're also doing a lot in terms of vegetables, both for local consumption and for exports. And uh, for Nigeria, for a country of 200 million, like you have mentioned, we will need to look into these areas of the hidden hunger, not just the main crops, but also to get the nutrients from our vegetables. So we hope to be able to build the horticultural sector and we'll keep pushing. And after this, I think it's created a discourse for us to speak some more. Um, we have Mr. Wasolat um, who has come in. So I think he has a question. Uh, so Wasolat, maybe you can, unmute your mic and ask your question while I look through the questions. Hello? Hello. Yes, so what question do you have? Yeah, um, I actually want to ask, uh, I, want, I actually want to talk with, to Mr. Bengo. Um, most of the question that has been, um, uh, that I have has been asked, in the previous time. However, while analyzing the fertilizers, we made mention of the micro and um, micro element, macro and micro 
nutrients. So I want to ask Mr. Bengon, because most of all these are local made fertilizer. Um, there, there will be, let me say there is a little, um, there is a little emphasis on the blending of all these micro uh, nutrients with all this fertilizer. So I want to know what are you, um, how do you want to put this one across? Because all this thing, this thing is also needed in the, in the uh, or what do you call it, in the uh, plant nutrition. So I'm asking of uh, the micro elements, the micronutrients. How are you blending this to all the other fertilizers? All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Wasola, for that question. Uh, I, I'm thinking about revolution, revolution, revolution in the fertilizer industry because there are a lot of new things coming up. And then the new uh, blends that we are producing now, uh, uh, micronutrients are included. But you know, we have to bring it uh, gradually because now, even the 2010 10, uh, the PFI that's been sold at 5,500, uh, we noticed that a lot of farmers, local farmers cannot afford that. But then now, if you ask the micronutrients, which we know that they are expensive, can the farmers afford it? But one thing I'm sure of is that if they see that this fertilizer is working, trust Nigerian farmers, even if it's as high as 8,000, 7,000, they can still go for it. So uh, the new fertilizer that are coming, the site and cost specific fertilizer, most of them contain some micronutrients, which are very, very important. Very, very important. If you are here or if you came, uh, or if you have joined us from the start, uh, I talked about that. I tried to discuss about that, about the role the micronutrients will play in the nutrients uh, balance. We just don't take food, but rather we take the quality of a nutrient food that will help us. Uh, it will fight some of these uh, the, the nutrient uh, deficiencies that we have among some of the children in Africa or in Nigeria. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bengom. Thank you very much for that. Um, another person we will have, um, if we can have uh, Musa Shehu. Are you on here with us, Musa? Musa? Hello? Yes. Yes, I see you have a question, so. Okay. Uh, even though I joined late, what I want to know is what is the difference between the different brand names of fertilizers that are found in the market with the recommendation given for each vegetable crop, which is normally in elemental form, like N, V205, and K20. So this is just my question. Okay, thanks a lot, Musa. So which of my panelists will want to answer? Um, this is quite a technical one. Who wants to answer this? Uh, Musa, the NP205 and K2 are just the form of, uh, of the element. We have P205 is the form of uh, phosphorus. And K2 is just the form of uh, potassium that's the fertilizer is supplying for you. And uh, if you want to do your, uh, your what is it called, uh, recommended rates for your crop, your analysis will be based on P205, K2, and, and not P and K, because the form in which your fertilizer comes from is, from is phosphate, which is P205 and K2. It's not something that is, it's just the form of fertilizer. Yeah, I, I think yes, I want... hello. All right, can I speak? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Bengal. 
All right. Uh, I think for uh, Mr. Ibrahim, if you, uh, what Musa is asking, if you can give him the grade, like, uh, you know, we have 20, 10, 10, uh, 15, 15, 27, 13, 13, and all that. I think that's what Saxon. I'm not into horticultural production, and we have not produced uh, so far for that. So maybe if you can help him, give him some fertilizer grade that he needs for his vegetable or horticultural production. I think that's what he's asking. Okay, okay. Okay. I think. Uh... We have uh, we have 2020, 20, we have uh, potassium nitrate which is uh, uh, 15 uh, 13046. We have uh, 15 15 30. We have a lot of fertilizers out there that you can use. We have MAP which is uh, 12 12 uh, 12061. Hello. I can answer the question. Hello? Yeah. I would like to throw more light on what Ibrahim said there. Okay, go on. Yeah. And um, like from my presentation, a fertilizer cannot just be given to you based on the fact that you want to do horticultural crops. But this fertilizer are crop specific. It also has to boil down to the type of crop you want to do. And like I said, it's also based on the soil you are using. So you can't just recommend a, a fertilizer to you outright and say, okay, use this. Of course, there are many fertilizers in the market, but you can't for certain mark out a particular one and say, this is, for instance, I say, okay, you are using um, that instead of map. I guess considerations that has to be taken into place for me to say you should use that instead of map. So it has to do basically with what you want to do the area you want to grow, like I listed some factors there. I think that will help. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, if I can come in again, I think the soil analysis and stages of crop is important as well in using these uh, fertilizers. When you have your soil analysis, you know what you have and the stage of your crop, like let's say at uh, roots develop, your plant that is just coming up, you need map for that. It's not that you are going to use map at the plant that is uh, that is fruiting, or you need your. Uh, the, it's just stages of plant that would that would determine which fertilizers that you are going to use. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Um, next we have Sally Sue, um, from Agrico. Uh, Sally, who sorry, Hamisu. Um, I think you wanted to add something, so we can let you put your input. Mr. Hamisu, can you hear me? Uh, yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes. So. Okay. Um. Uh, hello, everyone. Um. There's a question that I would ask about um, the difference between organic and inorganic nitrogen, and then I think uh, Mr. Uh, Gabriel answered that. But I would love to uh, add a few points to that. Okay. You see, um, plants take up nutrients in a certain form. Okay. So. For example, for nitrogen that he asked the question, plants only uh, absorb nitrogen in one of the two forms, either in the nitrate form or in the ammonium form. Now, inorganic fertilizers are readily available fertilizers. You know, the moment you apply them, they start supplying this either nitrate or ammonium and the plant can easily absorb them. But when you look at organic forms of nitrogen, they are not available. Sometimes they take weeks or even months to be converted to this uh, available form of nitrogen, which is called, uh, the process is called mineralization. So if you apply, for example, an organic man my manure to the soil, uh, it will take organic um, uh, uh, organisms, microorganisms, to convert that to amino acid, then to simpler form of proteins, uh, maybe uh, organic carbon, and then to ammonia. And then sometimes if these uh, microorganisms are in abundance, they are going to transform it again to, to nitrate, then the plant will be able to absorb it. Although the plant can absorb it uh, as an ammonium also. So, so it comes down to the availability and how fast this 
nutrient or this nitrogen is going to be released for the plant. When you apply an inorganic uh, N, it's going to be readily available, but it's going to be subject to leaching uh, and volatilization. So we are going to uh, lose it in the soil in a very quick time. But organic nitrogen will still longer in the soil because it's slow release. But the main problem with that is when you are already experiencing deficiency, then because it's releasing the nitrogen very slowly, sometimes in a matter of weeks, then you might not be able to get this nitrogen uh, for the plants to, to consume. So this is the little I want to add about the difference between the two forms of um, nitrogen. Okay, thanks a lot for that input, um, Baka. Uh, thanks a lot for that input, Hamisu. Um, it's quite an interesting one um, to realize the different forms of the that the plants consume the nitrogen. Um, it's been quite an educative forum, and there's been a lot of opinions and a lot of uh, views. I see that we still have some few more questions. Um, I have another question from Tajuddin. So, um, Tajuddin, I will let you speak. Uh, Tajuddin Abubakar, please, can you hear me? Hello, uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Mr. Tajuddin. Yeah, um, actually, um, uh, I just want to make a comment with regards to the position of uh, uh, FEPSAN. And um, I think generally, FEPSAN has to really uh, try to take a position of uh, responsibility uh, because the issue of fertilizer is a critical one in the country. And uh, they are actually the apex body that is uh, in charge of uh, or maybe um, looking at uh, or maybe harnessing uh, blenders and uh, uh, manufacturers of uh, fertilizer in the country. And in that view, they need to really work on, you know, you know, ensuring that their products uh, create that awareness and also create that demand. Because the, the issue is that I don't think it is right for person to say, yes, we know you, they are not the government, but they can do quite a lot with the government. They can do quite a lot with other association bodies. They can do quite a lot with other commercial farmers. And I think, even if it means FEPSAN uh, sponsoring bills that will uh, work on policies, I think I think it's okay. So uh, what I'm just saying is that it is actually uh, the activities is not being felt even by the commercial farmers. I am also a commercial farmer and I work with other smallholder farms. FEPSAN has the sole responsibility of marketing their products and making it visible to the farmers. It is their business, not the government. It is also their business to create awareness of the horticultural fertilizers. I'm telling you, in in other climes, you know, FEPSAN should be sponsoring this kind of trainings because eventually, the end, at the end of the day, we are still going back to them to purchase these fertilizers. So, automatically, when they create the awareness, they are creating the demand, and mm. when the demand comes, then they are in business. So this is where I want to I want to change the mindset of first first stand in, on this issue. I think they need to really uh, it's more of PPP, it's more of working with together partnership, and they uh, and they'll be able to achieve that goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tajuddin. Um, that's a, a very good comment. Um, I've been looking. I think uh, we were able to answer all of the questions that have been posed to us. Um, so as it stands, I would like to take it right back from the top. It's been a long morning of uh, questions, opinions, a lot of discussions about fertilizer. So I would like to my panelists to give them a chance. They've had what the people have to ask. Um, they've had their own says. Now we can hear back from them, some of their last thoughts and opinions. Um, as we are coming close to the end of this webinar. So I would like to start with Gabriel. Um, please, if there's anything you have to say, the floor is yours. Um, a few minutes to give us some of your last words. Hello, Mr. Gabriel. Hello, Mr. Kabir. Yeah. Yes. We, with the fertilizer 
talk with um we've talked a lot about that and we believe the Nigerian government wants um the country to be self-sufficient in food and feed. That's very important. And with what is happening, the banning of, of fertilizer, I still I still see, I don't know if um Fepsan, according to Mr. Bengal, I don't know if they really have the expertise, the technology, the capability to do what are soluble fertilizers, the horticultural grade fertilizers. But you only ban products and when there are provisions, leave down provisions on ground for them. So banning of these imports is not, we are not really against banning importation of fertilizers, which are needed for production of feed. But that's, those bans are killing the industry. When there is no short term, there is no short term plans to make sure that these things are available. Because with um, FEPSAN now, it's Fertilizer Producers and Suppliers Associations of Nigeria. And from the profile of the association, there's a, there's a body for importers to come into the association. But FEPSAN are not providing that avenue for importers to join the association. I might be wrong, but Mr. Bengu is sharing what I'm saying. So I believe once these products can be produced locally in sufficient quantity and quality, then when government is banning to save foreign exchange, that would be very, very justified. And thank you. Thank you so much for your input, Gabriel. Thank you. It's uh, been very educative and informative from your end. Um, so, Ibrahim, um, you're the farmer here. You're the big time farmer. So what do you have to say? Um, I think it's all boils down to the farmers. Thank you very much. Uh, I still want to portray the point of uh, Gabriel. I'll direct my last uh, you know, to Mr. Bengroom. I think the FEPSAN, they still need to do a lot. They need to do a lot for us, for farmers. Not only us, just for all other farmers as well. We need to do more. I, I don't, I too, I don't believe that uh, we, still, we have that capacity. We have what it takes to be on our own that say we have all these of cultural great uh, fertilizer we can make it in the country. I think FEPSAN still need to to be honest and be, be open to the government about this. It still boils down to production and production of uh, horticultural uh, fruit and vegetables is all of us, every day we, we, we consume vegetables in the country. So it's not just, a, we should not look at it all about the business, business and business. Femtime should do a lot, please and please, to help us talk to the government because you people have, uh, I, I believe you have connect to the government. Let them know what is on the ground. And uh, from there, I think all of us will be happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. Um, thanks for your input. Um, Mr. Bengum, um, over to you. Uh, thank you for your comments and for everything. Though when uh, Mr. Gabriel was making a comment, uh, my network was a bit shaky. But nevertheless, uh, he said something and I can, let me say, he just assumed, but that's not the true statement of what's on ground. He said there's no room for importer. He just Because uh, uh, 3,000 member organization you can think of. So maybe that's why I said, Mr. Gabriel, just as. Hello, Mr. Bengum. Thank you very much. Uh, I think on our end, oh, this is the first contact. That Hello? 
Yes, hello, we can hear you now. Yeah, sorry, the network is a bit shaky here. Yes, I say, uh... I say for Mr. Gabriel, uh, let me say for his last interview, he's an assumption. We have some work with a lot of people that want to identify uh, with her because it's an organization. I know it's not a must that you must belong to an organization, but if you are a big time importer, you want to register with FEPSA and be a partner with FEPSA, you can approach me. We can make all the formal arrangement and then we became a partner. But well, Mr. Ibrahim, thank you for the uh, suggestion. Uh, we, uh, we actually need to do more and we're doing more. Uh, this is the first contact uh, myself with the horticultural farmer, and I have learned a lot of things, and I see a prospect in that aspect. For Mr. Tajudin, uh, he made one comment, which I would like to clarify. He said, FEPSA activity is not being felt by even the commercial farmer, not even the smallholder farmer. Actually, uh, if he said that it has not been felt, then he can be very, very unfair to FEPSA, because I know the height we go just to get fertilizer this day into the country just to get fertilizer. While during the lockdown, a lot of people are in their comfort zone. But believe me, you every day I'm in the office, every day we are working ourselves up and down to see that there is a fertilizer available in the market. Uh, a lot of things happen. Some uh, production plants have been shut down because of Corona. We have to go as far as going to in, uh, India, getting some expatriate just to get the fertilizer. So it will be very unfair to say that the activity of FEPSA is not fair. Uh, FEPSA did not stop there. We have to go for policy. We have to develop a policy around quality control. We have to FEPSA sponsor the bill for fertilizer quality control bill so that that bill will protect the farmer. And now the bill has been enacted. Uh, it's not a bill, rather. The act has been enacted. And then very soon, it will, the law will uh, take its course. And then it's very unfair to say that FEPSA has not been there and not with this thing. If you don't know something, I'll advise you ask question, but don't make some assumption. This is a public space and a lot of people are seeing that. If you don't know an activity for an organization, you ask, but a lot has been happening in the industry and a lot has been put together just to see that the smallholder farmer benefited from this. Let me just... Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Bengum. Thank you for all our panelists. Thank you for the participants. It's been a very enlightening and um, quite interactive session. Um, some of the things we have seen that has crystallized clearly for me and for the Seeds for Change program is the fact that um, there's still a disconnect between FEPSAN and some of the horticultural growers. Um, we'll be looking towards that to see how we can bring FEPSAN and a lot of the vegetable growers in the same space. I think there needs to be more to understand uh, what the vegetable growers need, what can be done, and how FEPSAN as a body should think about um, getting their members to start producing more fertilizer suitable for vegetable production. Um, it doesn't have to always be just the soluble. There are the granular fertilizers that have mentioned, the DAP, the CAN, and the different blends that will be needed. Um, in terms of that, I have seen that there needs to be also a capacity building and a bit of support to FEPSAN as well. Um, we will be willing to discuss a lot more with FEPSAN, like we've mentioned on the Seed for Change program. We are currently developing crop guidance guides for smallholder farmers across the country. Um, we're doing that in English. We're also having that in Hausa for a lot of the Northern farmers so that they can read and access. Um, it will be good to be able to put fertilizer recommendations based on fertilizers that are actually available. Um, we're doing this in partnership with Wageningen University in the Netherlands, which uh, the top agricultural university in the world. Uh, and I think it will be a good uh, opportunity for members of FEPSAN or some of the technical team to be able to sit down and develop strategies and develop um, blends that we think will work for different crops at different stage. Um, the importance of horticulture cannot be under, uh, cannot be overemphasized. Uh, horticultural production in Nigeria has been on the increase. It's been a big money spinner. Uh, tomato plays a big role in our tomato in our food value chain. Yeah, tomato, onions, peppers, cabbage, watermelons. Those are some of the top consumed vegetables in the country. And if you are going to be commercially successful, 
we need good fertilizer regimens. We need good products in the market. Um, we're very happy for the level of interaction from everyone. We're glad that you took your time out today to be with us to discuss this. And we hope that this discussion can carry on and we can have productive outcomes from this. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and uh, let's all have a very nice day.